The Dharma, incomparably profound and infinitely subtle, is always encountered but rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. The Dharma, incomparably profound and infinitely subtle, is always encountered but rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. The Dharma, incomparably profound and infinitely subtle, is always encountered but rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm down here at the foot of uh, Bodhidharma's robe. Uh, Today is our Bodhidharma uh, memorial, I'm going to say celebration. And uh, we're also going to speak about uh, Master Dogen's Genjo Koan again. Now, last week, I think, or the week before, I said that, you know, sitting Zazen to relax or just uh, have some peace in life, that's excellent, and I support that. But I'm kind of uh, old school, and I believe that uh, our Zen practice is about, you know, clearing up a few things, like, what is this whole death thing? And uh, what are we in the universe? You know, the questions like that. And uh, that's exactly what I plan to do uh, for you today. By the end of this talk, you'll be all clear on this whole birth and death thing. And uh, uh, good, good you came in, Ms. Moore, just to, to see you. Uh, because by the end of this talk, you'll know all about this. Uh, it'll be all clear, this whole life and death thing and what you are in the universe. And it's a shame that uh, more people uh, from our Sangha are not here today because they're going to miss out and they're not going to know uh, the resolution of life and death and who they are in the universe unless they uh, they listen to this later. So uh, good for you all. Uh, I'm only half joking, by the way. OK, um, first off, uh, we're going to look again at uh, our uh, little uh, Bodhidharma um, statue. That is up there. I will switch over there just so you can see. Um, It is Bodhidharma's Memorial Day. Uh, This was the day, uh, I guess, uh, many centuries ago. I I, I have not counted exactly how many centuries. Let's see, uh, 13, 14 centuries ago. Was that it? No more. Anyway, when uh, he is said to have left this visible world, uh, some say he was assassinated. Uh, some say he was assassinated by other Buddhist priests who were jealous of Bodhidharma. It's a funny thing, but in some of those early stories, we have uh, uh, stories of assassination from jealous monks. Now, I don't know if that's true, uh, but uh, certainly we can all know that uh, Bodhidharma was a human being and he lived and he died because that is what people do. And uh, we can say, of course, in our hearts, he's still with us. So that is true. That is true. But the physical incarnation, the flesh and 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 bones of Bodhidharma, uh, they kick the bucket. And uh, as uh, all people do, and there's a legend that surrounds that and that statue represents that legend. Now, we actually don't know a lot about the historical Bodhidharma. Kind of like the Buddha, most of the stories, the famous stories about Bodhidharma, the the meeting with the emperor, the sitting in the cave for nine years, those were probably later, I don't want to say embellishments, they could have a basis in truth, we're not sure, but it doesn't matter, they've become the profound stories that we cherish. And one of those stories that is cherished by some is represented in that statue. You see, when Bodhidharma died, they put him in his grave with his shoes, all you know, dressed uh, properly. They gave him a proper burial. 
And then uh, I don't know what it was a few days later, or maybe a, a little more. They went back to the grave and for some reason opened it up and but um bump. He's not there. Well, there is one shoe there. Remind you of that story from the other religion? Where did Bodhi go? Now there's a report, not verified by many sources, but there is a report that he was seen on the road back to India carrying his other shoe. And that is what is depicted in the statue. Which leads me to a couple of questions. Isn't it a long walk without shoes? Why is he only carrying one shoe? I have another question related to that. And I don't know if if anyone agrees with me, raise a hand. I've had this happen again this week. You're driving your car down the road. You look at the side of the road and somebody left one shoe. Has anybody else seen this or is it just me? And it's always one shoe. Where's the other shoe? Okay. I, anyway, that's a that's a side story. But anyway, Bodhidharma, for some reason, leaves one of his shoes in the grave, walks all the way back to India carrying the other shoe. Is it true? Of course not. Of co- well, I don't think it is. Okay. How about the story in the other religion? No comment. I'm not part of the other religion. But I'm going to tell you what has, I'm going to tell you there is truth there. There is truth there. Why? I used to think that these are just silly stories that people need to have some miracle to believe in. It's not so simple. I believe it's a way to teach the most profound of profound truths about, shall we say, transcending life and death in a simple way that people can understand who might not be so comfortable with the, shall we say, finer points that I want to explain to you in the rest of today's talk. It's a little bit like when our cat died and my daughter asked me, where did Tinky go? Tinky got hit by a car. Uh, By the way, we always keep the cats in the house. Tinky just, that amazing cat knew how to open every window. I'm telling you, the cat knew how to unlock locks on the windows with his paw he would pull the lock down he'd slide the window slide the screen and i'd find the window unlocked the next morning i think he came back in sometimes closed the window and relocked it i'm telling you that was an amazing cat but anyway one day tinky got hit by a car uh through uh that's just what happened we wished he was uh, still with us and so my daughter asked where did tinky go and i you know did the uh, Tinky's at the uh, cat farm upstate? You know, I went uh, Tinky's. Uh, Tinky went to heaven, cat heaven, and is playing with the other cats. Our daughter was about six at the time. Do I literally think that Tinky's in cat heaven playing with the other cats? Could be, maybe. It's a lovely thought, but I'll tell you this: there's an essence of peace and wholeness beyond birth and death, more than meets the eye. And I trust this and know this, and I believe that's what we try to convey in images like heaven, or even this Bodhidharma stepped out of the grave and went back home. It's our true home. And my job today, this is what I get, this is why I get the big bucks, is to try to introduce you to this other way of seeing birth and death and all things and who you are in the universe, where this story, actually, when you look at it, him going home, I'm not still not sure what the shoe has to do with it, but him going home uh, is you going home to this true home. And actually there's some truth in it with a big T. Okay. With that said, let's dive into uh, Master Dogen. We covered, uh, I'm actually going to repeat a few lines. Let me uh, have my little coffee here, if I may. I'm going to repeat a few lines 
that we covered uh, last month because it continues and, and flows in together. And I used to think that these two sections maybe were kind of, that we're going to read today, these two sections are a little disconnected. But I actually, sitting with them more and more over the years, I realized that he's saying one thing. And I, I, will, I will cut to the chase to tell you where I'm going, that everything and everybody and every moment that happens is everything else in the whole thing. Uh, that's the topic you've probably heard me talk about 10,000 times if you've been coming to these Zazen Kai. But uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful representation of it. Uh, I told you that the Genjo Koan I feel is Dogen writing this letter to his lay father, Mr. Yo of Kyushu, who either maybe he was sick and, and, and contemplating death, or he suffered a loss of a child, something like that. You feel it in these words. This is about death. Very interesting that when Dogen is advising about death here, he doesn't tell the obvious story. He doesn't talk about Bodhidharma's miracle going back home. He doesn't talk about literal rebirth here in this letter. He talks about what we're going to discuss today, which is something like when death happens, man, it's the whole thing. Let it happen. Dive right in. Which is kind of a beautiful, beautiful response, but it's not the traditional Buddhist response that you would tell someone that, oh, your, your uh, loved one is now in the bardo and will be reborn and, and, and is in, or is in the pure land and is sitting at the foot of, of Buddha, like I'm sitting at the foot of Bodhidharma here. Let me, by the way, go back to everybody. You've seen Bodhidharma and me enough. There we are. There's everybody. Hi, everyone. Give a wave. There you are. Everyone who's seen one shoe by the side of the road, wave, wave your. Yeah, it's just this weird thing. Where's the other shoe? Anyway, anyway. So he's writing this letter and he doesn't talk about the Bardo. He doesn't talk about, you know, in 49 days, your child will be reborn. Any, nothing like that. Does that mean that Dogen did not believe in that? Some people want to say that, that some of the words here mean that Dogen did not believe in the traditional view of rebirth. I'm not so sure. Perhaps Dogen changed his views as he got older and sicker and closer to death. Perhaps he knew the audience he was speaking with. If he was speaking with, shall we say, uh, people who needed a more understandable version, he would give, you know, the, your, the cat has gone to cat heaven talk. Uh, some other writings of Dogen, he seems very traditional and very liberal, uh, very literal. He speaks about the bardo. He speaks about being reborn in the traditional way. But for some reason in this letter, doesn't mention it. And it's about death, which is interesting to me. Here he presents a view of, I'm going to sum it up, death is the whole thing, birth is the whole thing, life is the whole thing, you are the whole thing, everything is the whole thing, and because everything is the whole thing, and everything else is the whole thing, everything is everything else. This is where I say, dig it, man, give me a snap and fingers, dig it. Okay. Now he's talking about time here and, and birth and death, and he uses the example of firewood, which burns and turns to ash, right? Firewood comes before, there's a fire, it burns to, 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 to ash. In other words, there's a person here, gets hit by a bus, kaput, <laughs> turns to ash, right? That's the, what's, what he's talking about here. You should understand that firewood abides in the phenomenal expression and wholeness of firewood, which fully includes its own past and future, yet is independent of all past and future. What happens in this moment? From that pivot point, you judge all past and future. 
Yet this, what happens in this moment is the whole thing, so it's somehow timeless. In my book, I use the example of a dance. When a dancer takes this leap or this spin on her toe, it includes everything that came before in the dance, right at the tip of her toe. And everything that's going to come in the future of the dance is right there in this jump, this leap, right? It's all there, but yet in that moment, the leap is the whole thing. There is no before and after, just the leap. Kind of got that? So it, let's say you're seeing a two hour production of Swan Lake, right? And there's just scene three, there's a jump. Well, the jump includes everything in scene one and scene four or act four. So that leap has its own past and its own future, but yet in that moment, there's just scene two, this jump, which is the whole thing and timeless. Well, this is Dogen's view of your life and everything, you see. Right now, you each, Einstein said the same, you each are, are in your own being time, which for you includes all the past, all the future and everything, and yet is just this moment. Now, when ash comes, death, ash abides in the phenomenal expression and wholeness of ash, which fully includes its own past and future too. Now, just as firewood does not turn to firewood again after it is ash, do not think of returning to birth after death. This is the line that people say, oh, Dogen did not believe in rebirth. I think he did. He was a man of his times, a Buddhist, traditional. But I think he's saying something else here. When firewood happens, man, it's just firewood. When ash happens, it's just ash. When it's Tuesday, well, Tuesday includes the Monday that came before and the Friday that's going to come. But yet, don't think about Monday and Friday. It's just Tuesday. When it's life, man, it's the time of life, which includes everything before and everything after. And when it's death, it's the time of death, which includes everything before and everything after. But yet, in the time of life, live. But also when it's the time of death, die or die trying, I like to say. Live as if your life depended on it. Live well. That doesn't mean like, you know, carpe diem, you know, let's go out and drink champagne and race. You know, that's not Dogen. Live well in the time of life and in the time of death. When it comes, look back and say kind of, well, well done. Sayonara. That's Dogen. Thus, it is an established rule in Buddhist teachings to deny that birth turns into death. Very weird statement because Buddhism is a lot about birth turning into death, turning into birth again. But yet he says Buddhist teachings deny that birth turns into death. Therefore, birth is understood as no birth, for in the time of birth there is no other moment with which to compare it. Waves on the ocean seem to rise. Waves on the ocean seem to fall. When we realize it's all the ocean, there was nothing coming or going. And yet when the wave has risen, man, it's the time of just the wave. And when the wave has fallen, it is the time of just the falling. Although nothing is coming and going, just in that moment, there is what is. Even sometimes the things I say, I got to play that back later to see what I just said. But I think I got it. I think I got it. In the time of birth, it's no birth because that's the only thing. It's just the ocean. In the time of death, there's no death because it's the only thing and it's just the ocean. So while to our ignorant human eyes, it looks like things are coming and going, there's just this moment, and this moment, and this moment, which is the only moment, which is just the wholeness, the ocean. 
Therefore, it's the established rule in Buddhist teachings to deny that birth turns into death. Therefore, birth is understood as no birth, for in the time of birth, there is no other moment with which to compare it. It is an unshakable teaching in Buddha's preaching that death does not turn into birth. Therefore, death is understood as no death when there is no other moment with which to compare it. When there's death, there's only death because it's the whole universe. You can't have anything else outside the universe. And so death is the only thing, which is the whole thing. When there's life, it's the whole universe living and there's nothing else, nothing more to compare because it's the whole universe, the whole thing. So it's always the whole thing. The one thing. And that's great. That's it's beautiful. Um, we think that this step in the dance leads to the next step in the dance. For example, I'm a dancer. I'm doing my twirl. Two minutes later, I'm doing my leap. We think the twirl, step, 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 went to the leap. This is our usual way of seeing time. Dogen's way of seeing time is a little different. Get this, it's very important. When there's this leap, that's the only thing there is, and it's the whole dance. Don't think about what's coming five minutes ago. Don't think about what was an act before. This leap, this step, is the entire production of Swan Lake on the tip of the dancer's toe. And it's all there. It's the whole thing. So what's lacking? What, what's going to change? And, 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 okay, now five minutes later, there's a jump. Now that jump is on the same stage. It's the same stage come to life. It is also all of Swan Lake now in that jump it's the whole thing in the jump therefore nothing has changed same stage same production now become a jump but you think the leap step time 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 became a jump no the whole dance was the whole dance, was the whole dance, was the whole dance, nothing has come and gone, and yet everything is dancing. Does that convey a little bit of what this is? If Even if you, the, you, you, you're completely confused now, would you just please nod to make me feel good? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just... Okay. So uh, I put up... Um, uh, Georges Serot's painting, I believe it's called Sunday in the Jardin Jaff, which leads to another great mystery besides the one shoe by the, by the side of the road. Why do the French just put all those extra letters in and then they don't say them? I have no idea. They always got a, like a, a consonant at the end and then they just, you know, ignore it, you know? So Jardin Jaff, I believe is how it's pronounced. I don't know. Bjorn, you're kind of in close to the closest one here right now to France. You have no idea. Okay. All right. Anyway, so that's a pointillism. Okay, it's pictures of a, a, a people in a, a park, and uh, if you get close, you know the everyone know the painting. Raise your hand if you know the painting. It's pointillist painting. She just put dot 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 right, and when you get really close, you see it's oh, it's just dots. Right. And then you get back and you say, oh, it's a little girl's shoe. And then you get back further and you say, oh, the little girl's shoe, which is just made of dots, is this whole pain painting of of a picture of people in a park and which is kind of like our universe, all reality. Now, if I tell you 
Oh, the girl's shoe is part of the painting. Oh, I get that. Yes, a part. The painting is made of parts. And the girl's shoe is made of dots of paint. Yes, I get that. Each stroke, each dot uh, together makes the shoe. The shoe makes the painting. So I guess that each dot is part of the shoe. And the shoe is part of the painting. And I say now, but here's the Buddhist first step on the Buddhist understanding. You know that the dots are in the shoe and the shoe is in the painting. But please understand, the entire painting is in the shoe. The entire painting and the shoe is in each dot. Huh? Now that, you know, confuses people for some reason. Why? Why you only look at it one way? And the Buddhists realize you can look at it both ways. You feel that you are one thing in the universe. And I'm here to tell you, Preacher Jundo is here to tell you that the entire universe is in you. Hallelujah. Is you. Not in you. Is you. Is you. The entire painting is coming to life in every scene, every character in the painting, every dot, every molecule in the dot contains the entire scene. The entire dance of Swan Lake is in every gesture, movement, leap, twirl, even the stumbles and falls of every dancer contains the entirety. This is how we look at who we are in the universe, too. Which is pretty good. So next time you feel that you're just an inconsequential dot in the whole, realize that if that even that one little dot was missing, the restorers would have to come and put it back because there would be a big hole in Georges Sherat's painting. That's who you are. And not only don't feel inconsequential as just this one dot, you're not only an, a dot in the whole, in this whole galaxy of galaxies, of trillions and trillions of galaxies we call the universe. You're the whole thing. But don't let it go to your head, because so is everything else. But you are the whole thing. Um, without that single dot, there'd be a big hole in George Sherratt's painting, like as if someone took a cigarette and made a hole right in it. You'd have to come back and something would be missing. And the shoe. Now, now people think, oh, it just means we're all independent. You can see that if you have all the dots in the shoe together, they all need to work together and support each other to make a shoe. So people think, oh, it's just all about interconnection. This dot and the other dot and the other dot and the other dot and the other dot. And when we step back, we see all the dot dots supporting and contributing to each other make the shoe. And the shoe and the tree and the man over there and the grass makes the entire park. So we all, you can see the grass needs the tree, the tree needs the character person to make a universe. This dot needs the other dot, needs this dot to support each other to make a shoe. So we feel, oh, this is what Buddha, Buddhism is talking about. We're all just interconnected and supporting each other. And that's true, true. Don't get me wrong, that's true. But it's saying more than that. It's saying, you're not all working together to make the shoe. You are the shoe. That one that Bodhidharma's carrying. I gained a connection. The shoe of the little girl and the shoe that Bodhidharma's carrying. And by the way, the rubber boot by the side of the road here I passed yesterday. Yes, it's all the whole thing. And the shoe's on your feet. You're not just a dots and dots and dots making the shoe. You are the shoe coming to life in every single dot and the whole painting coming to life in every single dot. Now to convey that, Dogen um, has another beautiful and famous scene here of the moon in the water. The moon represents the wholeness, shall we say, the wholeness, the clarity, the light. And then he brings the light down to shine in every damn thing on the planet Earth. 
which was Dogen's world. I'm sure we can include all the other planets here too. It's not, you know, this is truly a un universal vision. Our enlightenment is like the moon reflected in the water. The moon does not get wet. The water is not broken, right? When, let's say there's a, a, a dot of dew on the end of a piece of grass and the moon is fully reflected in that piece of dew. You can see the whole moon in the tiny drop of dew on the end of a blade of grass. But yet the moon is untouched by that. It's not damaged. It doesn't lose anything. And the dew is not losing anything by having the moon within it. That's what he's saying. The moon is the wholeness of it all, you see, which is contained in every little drop of paint, every little twirl of the dancer, every drop of blood in you, like that. Our enlightenment is like the moon reflected in the water. The moon does not get wet. The water is not broken. Although the light shines wide and vast, covering everything, the moon is reflected in a puddle a foot or an inch wide. When the puddle is an inch wide, the moon is an inch wide. When the puddle is a foot wide, the moon's a foot wide. When the, when the, it fills a lake, it's, it is as vast as the lake, the ocean, on and on and on and on. You see. Big and small is not of concern to the moon. The moon is fully contained, contained and embodied in and as everything. The entire moon and the whole sky are reflected in countless dewdrops upon the grass and even in a single drop of water. And this is you. This is you, too. Enlightenment does not divide a person just as the moon does not shatter the water. We cannot obstruct enlightenment. The wholeness is always just whole. It never becomes less whole from anything I'm saying. From you being born or dying, it's, it's still the whole. It's still the whole dance. The dance of Swan Lake is never obstructed by anything that's happening on the stage. As a matter of fact, it's all brought to life as everything that's happening on the stage, including when things go wrong, including when the dancer trips and falls or stumbles. It's all the wholeness of the dance, you see. We cannot obstruct enlightenment just as a drop of water does not obstruct the moon in the sky. The depth of each drop is the measure of the height of the moon. No matter how long or short the duration of each reflection or the duration of each life, it expresses the largeness or smallness of the dewdrop. Our lives are as fragile as dewdrops, yes, lasting for a time then. Yet completely holds the boundlessness of the moonlight in the heavens. So you got to stop thinking that you're only a small little inconsequential thing, person, drop of dew here for a time amongst the billions and trillions of years. You are the billions and trillions of years. And you are the whole thing. I'm sorry, I'm not going to save you and say that you're actually going to live for trillions of years. I actually think that would be kind of boring. My joke is how many season reruns of Star Trek could I watch in a billion years? Boy, I would really know every line. But anyway, you know, life, I'm kind of glad that life is kind of finite. I've spoken to some, I used to volunteer in a hospice and I spoke to actually some elderly people there. The wisest, more than one person said this to me and they said, it's been enough. It's good. I'm ready to go. Can you imagine? What a great thing. Ah, okay, enough. I had all the ice cream I could eat. I watched all the, you know, I, I Love Lucy reruns, whatever it was, you know, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to see the cat, whatever it is. They were all ready to go. 
That's the way I want to. I want to lie on my bed and go, okay, that was nice. I, well done. And sayonara. Dive in as if your death depended upon, which is what Dogen's talking about here. It is now the time of death. Let it come. Now, you're young. Everyone look I'm looking at here is uh, pretty young there. I mean, all of you. Yeah. So uh, may this not happen soon. I'm not wishing it upon you. But when it comes, you know, or it comes to someone in your life, uh, that's why I said we're celebrating Bodhidharma's passing today. You see, Let's welcome it with joy. Well done. Well done, Bodhi man. Good job. So um, now just a, a little footnote before we end here today. I, my one criticism about Dogen here is he gives some stagnant images, relatively stagnant. So, for example, he said, you know, the firewood turns to ash. And those are kind of fixed things. And then he talks about the moon reflected in the water. It's kind of a like a painting. Or I talked about Surat's Jardin de Jaff. And I said, it's a, you know, a painting's a fixed thing. I like my dancing image more. Why? It's alive and vibrant and ongoing. It's not fixed at all. This dot, man, is always changing. The dance is never, you cannot nail it down. The, the, the tip of the toe was here and it's gone, man. It's on to the next thing. The, the, if you look at the dewdrops on the water, the lake, the lake is always swirling. The ocean is always rolling. The dewdrop is always changing. The, it's all, our lives are always in motion. And this motion, this whole dance is the thing, not the fixed painting. So what I said about the painting is, is true. The dot is the shoe, is the garden. But the garden is alive with people. It, you've been to gardens and parks on a, on a, oh, by the way, what a beautiful fall day today after this hot summer. The sky is literally without a cloud. The, it, it is, I got to get the bicycle, man. It, it is such a beautiful day here. Okay. This is a, this is a day like that. But the tomorrow, rainy or snow, whatever it is, also will be the whole thing, right? It's all the planet Earth on the rainy day. It's all the planet Earth on the sunny day. It's all the planet Earth when the earthquake comes. Whatever it is, man, it's the whole thing. So this is the vibrant image that Dogen is trying to project here. I went to an art museum in Tokyo um, just earlier this year, and they had taken AI, and they took, I think this was one of the paintings they did this to, they took these classic impressionist and post-impressionist paintings, and they brought them to life. Suddenly the characters in the painting, like Van Gogh's portrait, and Van Gogh kind of steps over and waves at you and gives you a wink. It was weird. All right, well done, but it was a little weird. The, the paintings were brought to life. And suddenly the people in the garden are kind of moving around and the child is kind of playing with her ball, not just frozen in the painting. So I want to say everything I told you is true, but please remember these are not stagnant images. The whole dance, play, rolling is this truth of everything is everything else. So, and death is that too. Death is the whole thing. Life is the whole thing. This moment is the whole thing. All right. And that's the whole thing in my talk. 